Thanks, Mary. Uh, my name is Rania Bautista. I am the project coordinator for Project Play Harlem, which we announced at last year's summit. Earlier this year, we released the State of Play Harlem, which many of you received when you checked in earlier today. In the course of our work, we learned of the Saturday Night Lights program. Capturing the attention of communities around the country, Saturday Night Lights often refers to the fanfare around weekend sporting events. In Manhattan, thanks to the effort of uh, our district attorney, Cyrus Vance Jr., uh, Saturday Night Lights refers to an innovative program that provides uh, for open gyms and league play during the high crime hours of Friday and Saturday nights. DA Vance is here with us today uh, to share the story of how communities in New York have laid the groundwork for uh, unexpected municipal leaders to lead the way in growing access to sport for youth. In this case, uh, the district attorney's office uses funds from confiscated uh, drug arrests to support the positive community programming of, uh, through sports. Cyrus Vance has been the Manhattan district attorney since 2010. DA Vance's achievements include launching Saturday Night Lights, his signature youth development and violence prevention program that funds the world-class and fitness training in safe spaces for youth ages 11 to 18 across Manhattan. DA Vance is also known uh, is also known for his takedowns of major gun traffickers in, and international cyber crime operations. The first ever convictions on New York State terror charges and the allocation of $35 million to help end the national backlog of untested rape kits. He has reduced unnecessary incarcerations and ended the prosecution of thousands of low-level nonviolent offenses annually. Most recently, ending the criminal prosecution for marijuana, possession, smoking, and as well as turnstile jumping. DA Vance is the co-founder and co-chair of the Prosecutors Against Gun Violence and co-founder of the Global, uh, Global, Global Cyber Alliance. And here to moderate the conversation is Luis Fernando Yosa, a Peruvian American writer, editor, speaker, investigative reporter, youth sports consultant, and full-time father coach. His first book, Beyond Winning, Smart Parenting in a Toxic Sports Environment, co-authored co with Kim John Payne and Scott B. Lancaster, is a candid practical guide to help parents navigate the fanatical results-obsessed world of youth sports. Youth sports have been the prim a primary passion for Yosa, uh, who has coached soccer for 25 years and humbly acknowledges he knows little and has mucho to learn. He recently co-founded Whole Child Sports, an organization that aims to help develop a healthier and creative youth sports experience for kids across America. Thank you both for being here with us today. Pleasure to be with you here today, uh, uh, Cy. Uh, I've, uh, as a journalist, I've reported sort of the darker side of sports for many years, and it was uh, much to my surprise and delight uh, as I looked around uh, America for a good, good stories, good things happening in youth sports, to hear uh, through a, a neighbor and good friend, uh, uh, Chauncey, who works uh, directly with with uh, with the district uh, attorney. Uh, about this great program that they've launched. And so let's just launch right into it. And I'll ask you, uh, uh, can you share some of the background of Saturday Night Lights, how it got started, how you came up with the idea, and how it's working? Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, and the Aspen Institute, thank you for ha having me. Luis, thank you for uh, asking me questions. Uh, Chauncey Parker, who's here with me today, actually came up with this idea. Uh, uh, Chauncey works in my office. I'm the Manhattan District Attorney. It's a very large uh, state prosecutor's office that uh, covers Manhattan. Uh, and obviously one of the focuses that we have, uh, which is a relentless focus, is on how do we drive violence down in our neighborhoods. And I think New York City has been amazingly successful, Luis, in driving violent crime down. Our homicide rate has gone from 2,300 in 1992 to 245 last year. So it's really been a remarkable, 
a remarkable decline. But when I became DA, there was still gun, there was gangs, gun violence, gun trafficking. And uh, I am always looking for ways to try to prevent violence, not just prosecute violence once it's happened. I think we can all agree if I can keep the gun out of a kid's hand, uh, that's a better outcome than prosecuting the young man or woman for having that gun. So uh, Chauncey came back uh, to me one, one evening. We were focusing on trying to identify where violence was uh, in, in pockets in Manhattan. And he came back and he said, you know, Cy, I just was at the Police Athletic League gym in Central Harlem. This was a Saturday. And he said, the gym's closed. In fact, in many of the developments uh, and, and the neighborhood organizations around Manhattan, the gyms are closed on Saturday and, and Sundays because they don't have the funds to open the gyms. And so Chauncey and I sat down and it was very simply, that makes no sense what for, whatsoever. Uh, particularly in economically disadvantaged neighborhoods, you have kids who are at risk on Friday, Saturdays, 5 to 9 p.m. as the young lady suggested, uh, kids who are 12 to 18 and now we have kids 8 to 18. And uh, they, they want very much uh, to have some place to go where they will be given exceptional opportunities. And so what we did was we started with one site, uh, brought in essentially professional basketball trainers, the guys who train guys like Kobe Bryant, who was here with this morning, who really are, you, could, you can't get these guys, even if you're a millionaire, but they agreed to work for us. And we started to provide um, basketball uh, on Saturday nights at this location. And we didn't know how it would go. But after about two months, it, the place was jammed because kids knew that what they were getting, they could not get anywhere else. And they came for the basketball, uh, and then they stayed for the experience, not just the basketball, but for uh, the team building and, and, the, and the experience of being uh, in a really beautifully managed sports program. And that's how it started. We started with one location. Now we have 14. Uh, we've serviced, served about 12,000 kids. Uh, we're going to move now out to the other boroughs of the city uh, starting in January, so we'll add about 2,000. And, uh, and we have moved from basketball now to uh, offering programs in soccer and rugby and tennis because people have different loves in sports and, and dance as well because not everyone wants to play with a bat or a ball. And so that's where we are today. And without Chauncey, it wouldn't have happened. And without the parents uh, who were bringing their kids in, it wouldn't have happened. And without the kids who bring their little brothers and sisters along who have got their nose up against the glass window and they see what their older brother and sister is doing and loving it. And so they're the next generation of kids who've come in. So there, uh, today we've been focusing a lot on, on sort of a grassroots <laughs> local, local work with kids and organizations. And, uh, and also on the quality of coaching. And I think uh, Kobe talked about this too, uh, the great coaching that he got. Right. One of the things that interested me when we spoke earlier was that uh, the big draw for these kids, and you mentioned it briefly, but I'd like you to uh, talk a bit more about it, was not simply that you were given an opportunity to play basketball right. on a Saturday night rather than you know, <laughs> vandalizing or committing a crime. Or being but, victims of a or crime. Or being victims of a crime, exactly but that yeah, you brought really masterful yeah. coaches, coaches who weren't just there to, to teach them moves, but to uh, show them a way of being. Well, I think those of us who played sports growing up, and I'm sure it's a lot of the people in this room, I think we all realized how powerful experience that was in our upbringing. And it gave us a sense of confidence. It gave us a sense of teamwork. Uh, it connected us, as it does in Manhattan sometimes, with. Uh, youths who are you know, in other, you know, who are in conflict with you uh, because you're associated with different parts of the community. And the basketball program uh, brings all those kids together and breaks down some of those barriers. But what you need is you need really first class, world class coaches. Now, we all, you know, if you put 20, 15 year olds in a gymnasium, you would expect a lot of noise and probably a lot of disorganization, even if you threw a, rolled a couple of basketballs uh, onto the middle of the court. But when I was going to Saturday Night Lights, what blew me away is you had 20 to 30 kids uh, who were absolutely laser focused on what was being taught, who were dead silent, who were taking their drills so seriously, and that's what comes from superior coaching. Those kids are motivated uh, because they know they're getting something special, and then the word gets out and, 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 and more people want to join. And thank God for the coaches. Uh, they, they make all the difference. And we really wanted to do one thing well 
to do sports well. It's like Starbucks does one thing well, it makes coffee, and maybe if it starts selling other things that's not as good as their coffee, uh, we really want to stick with one thing, which is doing superior coaching uh, in these core sports programs. Can you talk a bit more about setting this program up, where the funding was coming from? Raina touched on it a bit, right. but if you could develop that a bit more. And also, uh, how hard was it to make this happen logistically and politically? The funding comes from aspects of our work as a prosecutor's office. We do prosecute drug dealers. We also prosecute large financial institutions. And sometimes the penalties associated with those prosecutions are enormous uh, in the many, many millions of dollars. And this really is, I realized, was an opportunity for our office to take the proceeds of criminal activity and not buy cars or uh, you know, more, more things that are more furniture, more cars for an office or for a police, but to invest these dollars in our communities where the money, particularly today, is no longer. And so this was our opportunity to invest in our communities. Again, for me, it, the, the message that I want to send and the, re, and the result that I want to achieve is I want to use Crime fighting isn't just about what you do in a courtroom. Crime fighting is using all the strategies and tools you have in whatever government position you have to affect the behavior of kids and others in your neighborhoods. And so uh, the, the funding came from our, uh, our, our criminal prosecutions and, um, and, we've, uh, and, much, and even larger settlements are funding uh, huge investments by our office in crime prevention strategies in, in our neighborhoods beyond Saturday Night Lights. No political pushback. Uh, uh, interesting, when an office isn't beholden to the mayor's office for funding, that's kind of a dislocation <laughs> for the mayor. Uh, they, <laughs> so it gives us independence uh, in a whole variety of ways, and it gives us, uh, frankly, the ability to uh, set my own priorities. I want Manhattan to be as safe as possible. Whatever your community is, you want the same thing. I had a unique opportunity to invest in our kids to make that happen. We share, we share these dollars now in other counties uh, around the city because what's working in Manhattan can work elsewhere. And uh, I would just say it's really, a, it's, a, it's been a total pleasure and uh, a total success. And as I said, 12,000 kids, um, uh, there's not every day a DA's, a DA's office where your job is crime fighting enables you to j do just that, but do it in such a positive uh, and optimistic way that actually may change lives and, and, and bring kids together. There's two, um, there's in your materials, there's a young story about uh, a, a, a young boy who came from West Africa, and uh, I've got it somewhere here, but he came right. to West Africa, was you know, a newcomer to the community, uh, didn't know anybody, uh, language issues, and he joined our, bas our, our soccer program in East Harlem on 116th Street. Now he's 12 years old and quoted in this, uh, in, in this article, and he sounds like he's 21, yeah. uh, and basically says what this did for him was it broke the barriers between who he was as a West African kid and who he became as a New York City kid, not losing his, not losing his identity, but matching up with the community and magnificent. There's a, there's a video that was played at the World Cup uh, at halftime in one of the matches of our East Harlem program as well. It was a young Latina. Uh, she was uh, struggling as a young teenager with drugs, uh, with, uh, with gangs. Uh, she was in conflict with her mom, and she joined the Saturday night program. Uh, she also uh, was LGBT. She hadn't told her parents, uh, and that was something that was very conflicting to her. She joined the program. Uh, and as she said, and, and you can see this if you want at manhattanda.org slash SNL, this beautiful, uh, beautiful statement by this beautiful young woman who said that were it not for this soccer program, I wouldn't have had the confidence to get out of the bad stuff that I was doing, to be honest in my conversations with my mother as to who I was. And it changed her life, uh, as she says in this video. And I didn't even pay for this movie. I, I mean, someone made it without us being involved in it. <laughs> Uh, and, uh, and, and it's just, you know, thrilling. And I'm a parent, like, all, like many of you are here. What, what we all want is to our kids to have a safe, uh, safe place to go, to have a positive future. And uh, when we have the opportunity to do something to create that, I'm sure after I long leave the job, I will have prosecuted many cases, and I think that's all for the good. Uh, but I think it's restoring communities uh, to, to health and providing support and making our neighborhoods feel connected and safer. That's really a legacy that I want to leave. 
Fantastic. Can you talk a bit about uh, how this has changed the way people in your very office interact with sure. people who they're presumably policing or working with? Well, I think it's very important for prosecutors in particular who are putting people into jail uh, to, first of all, go into jails and experience what, uh, experience the consequences of their actions and to be educated about you know, what our relationship should be. Um, and, uh, and so my assistants are now involved with projects uh, in prisons, uh, uh, helping, we pay for college education with our forfeiture dollars for the state of New York for guys in prison because that's the number one crime reduction thing you can do is get someone who is in prison, get that person a college degree, that is the most important thing you can do to reduce recidivism. So I'm encouraging, my wife works in prison, uh, and so I go often with her to, to the program she works in, but the young men and women who are, who are learning to work with the incarcerated men and women, uh, to a person, they come out impressed, as I am so impressed by, often by the intelligence, the directness, the, the self-awareness, of people who are in prison. And, uh, and, and I, before I, when I was a young DA uh, in the office, I, I, I didn't have this awareness at all. But I think what it, what it does is it gives us as an office and the assistants as an office um, a sense of what the response, that, that you are not just defined by what you did, but also by what you can become. But you have to learn who that person is and their potential is to kind of care about who helping them become uh, something that is perhaps bigger uh, than they imagine. And so I think it's, I think it's about uh, assistance learning that we have a responsibility when we send people to jail or we put people in programs, we have a responsibility for the outcome when they come out. And we have a responsibility to make sure that we do everything so they succeed when they get out, right. so they don't go back into the troubles that got them there in the first place. It's just, it's common sense. It's just kind of a different way of thinking about crime fighting for a DA's office. So you, so you have actually had uh, assistant prosecutors and police officers attend some of the youth sporting events uh, yes, they, and get involved. I've got DAs who are coaches uh, with the kids and police officers as well. But, but also, I think we need to be realistic. You know, we, we created this, Chauncey created this great New Jersey for our program, Saturday Night Lights. It's a very retro black jersey with nice white lettering. But what we had on the old jerseys was the big DA logo on the front and the big NYPD logo. <laughs> and so what we did with this one, because of input from the kids, was they really didn't want uh, a jersey uh, identifying themselves with a DA or the police. <laughs> but they loved the retro Saturday Night Light things. So now our logo is about the size of a quarter. <laughs> it's on the inside of the back of the shirt. Uh, but just that, do it. <laughs> and uh, again, I, you know, I can't say enough about Chauncey Parker, who uh, who came up with this idea and who really helps direct our 600 lawyers on how we can be more thoughtful about uh, uh, offenders, uh, both pre entry into the system uh, and, yeah. and, and then when they come home. It's a this is how we actually change the criminal justice system is we. We need to put less people in prison. We need to find ways to keep our community safe uh, at the same time, and it is doable. And I think the attitude in America is changing on this, and it certainly changed in Manhattan. Can you touch briefly on a few of the challenges that you've faced in implementing the program, in, in uh, moving it to different communities so that other youth organizations can have a sort of a window uh, into that? I think our, 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 I think our challenge has, has been our office, our, where we started it was strictly excellence in a, in a basketball program. And then I think we started to think about, well, we, should we do teaching and should we do cognitive behavioral therapy? All those things are excellent. You know, those are what kids often need, particularly if there is some trauma in the family. But I think we ultimately felt after three or four years of providing those services that we really weren't expert in those services. That, that really we needed to go back like Starbucks to just making the best cup of coffee and having a sports program that was excellent. So we expanded, we tried, we, we, with, with good intentions, we tried to do more than we originally did, but realized that because of other investments we're making in Manhattan in a number of areas, we can now transfer those kids, offer those kids who have needs in uh, trauma, 
or uh, any issues around criminally justice involved kids, we can transfer them to other programming that we provide outside of our sports program and just stick to sports. I was particularly impressed when you think about uh, all the work that you've done. It's about connection, right? It's about connecting prosecutors, police officers with kids, great coaching with kids who don't get it, great, uh, great kids with uh, spaces that they don't uh, necessarily get an opportunity to be in, but it's also about safety, the safe space. And uh, one of the things that I learned about this program is that uh, in some areas of East Harlem, uh, uh, there are project wars. In other words, if you're from Project A and uh, you pass through Project B, you're going to have problems, yeah. and they don't like each other. It's just a turf issue. Well, right? it's very much the and case. And you guys have worked on that in, very, on the court. Yeah, it's, well, we, if, if we have kids coming from all over the city, uh, even to the Harlem. They'll just come up from the Bronx or Queens. But we do have kids who, unfortunately, are uh, in gangs, and that's not uncommon. And they, uh, you know, they, they come from different developments, housing developments, and sometimes those are the centers around gang violence, uh, crews, we call them. And they end up on the court uh, or, or coming into the gym and they see this person who's in an opposite crew. And, and sometimes that, you know, that, could, that could be a problem. It could start a fight. So there are many times, particularly when we started, that both the police and our, you know, our, our uh, community partners who were working with us would make sure that we were driving kids home after the event so they could get home safely without having to walk through a neighborhood where they were at risk. And so there's, and that's, uh, a reality, I bet, in almost every urban area that you're going to have kids, if they're coming from the neighborhoods, uh, they're sometimes they're going to be in conflict. But you put them on the court together, uh, you know, after six months, we'll have a January 12, you're all invited to New York City, basketball city. We'll have like uh, 20 different teams from all the sites uh, in the city. Each team is named after a college, uh, whether it's Connecticut College or Stanford. So everybody who's on a team starts with the, you know, I'm on the Stanford team. Uh, and what you're saying is you can go to Stanford. There's nothing that you can't do. So it's all that kind of positive reinforcement. Uh, and and it's, it's, mag it's really fun. And I hope it's January 12, Basketball City, Manhattan. Uh, talk a little bit about the scalability of what, you do what you're doing. Do you think that, and not just in cities, but in rural communities too, uh, this kind of thing can be done uh, with the auspices of or the energy of uh, DA, DA office, DA, DA Absolutely. And first of all, and I did not invent midnight basketball. I mean, this has been going on uh, all over the country for a long time. But but uh, it is definitely scalable. And my, my my what's now being done, I know in other New York State cities. But ultimately, it's a question of do you have the funds? Each of these sites costs about seventy five thousand dollars a year to operate, uh, to keep the gym open, to hire the people you need. And uh, there should be a thousand Saturday night lights uh, around. Uh, cities because uh, it makes sense. Yeah. This is great. Oh, do we have time for some questions or no? Okay. <laughs> All right. No quit. Thank you. Everybody. Not even that uh, that app. <laughs> Thanks, Luis. That was great. Thanks a lot.